This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome veterans and members of our armed forces abroad who are listening over the Internet today. I also want to welcome listeners in Chicago who are tuning in on WCPT. Thank you for being with us. My guest today is one of our country's foremost technologists and visionaries. In just a moment, pioneer and former director of MIT's Media Lab, Mr. Frank Moss, will be joining us. We're going to have a rare look at one of America's greatest assets, our ability to innovate and use those breakthroughs to shape a better future. But before we get started... Let me tell you a little bit about Moss's background. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and by the time he was a teenager, the science bug had already bitten him. He was fascinated by America's space program, which led him to obtain an undergraduate degree in aerospace and mechanical sciences from Princeton University and his graduate degrees from MIT. Moss's career began at IBM Scientific Center in Israel and later at their Yorktown Heights Research Center in New York. In addition to holding executive positions at Apollo Computer and Lotus Development, Moss was the CEO of Tivoli Systems, which merged with IBM in 1996. Tivoli became the network and systems management division of IBM, quickly growing into one of the company's largest, most profitable business areas. But that's just the beginning of the story. Moss also co-founded Stellar Computer, Bow Street, Infinity Pharmaceuticals, and Bluefin Labs. In 2006, he became the director of MIT Media Lab. Moss is also credited with the creation of the Systems Biology Department at Harvard Medical School, and he advises the Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation, along with other esteemed learning institutions such as Princeton University. He is also an advisor to a plethora of startups, many of which are pioneering new ways to give people control over living longer and healthier lives. Lastly, I want to mention that Moss wrote a riveting book called The Sorcerers and Their Apprentices, which if you haven't had a chance to read yet, mix makes for one heck of a summer read. I, You know that I don't mention books much on this program, but I will tell you that this is one of those books that when you pick it up, you don't want to put it down. And you know, how many books do you really get that are like that? So I do really recommend this book, particularly if you're interested in technology and innovation. It's my great privilege to welcome to the program a tireless technologist, thinker, and leader, Mr. Frank Moss. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Moss. Rebecca, can you hear me? I can hear you sort of faintly in the background, but, uh, you know, there you go, technology biting us in the rear ends again. Well, you know, I've really been looking forward to talking with you because um, we were both fortunate to work in technology during the 80s. Which, when you look back now, reminds me a little bit of the movie The Right Stuff. You know, technology was an adventure, and everyone who was involved had a sense that they were part of something very important and and interesting. Uh, But in those days, I'm not so sure we were as focused on the end result as we are today. So I wanted to open our program by asking you how our attitudes toward innovation have changed, and, and what do you think is behind that change? Well, they, they have indeed changed. I mean, the fun part of being in this industry and a technologist is that we never dreamed that technology would have such an impact on people's everyday lives. Mm-hmm. We, were building, we were building computers that, you know, that were in the back office or maybe moved to the front office in businesses and hospitals and elsewhere. But, but the fact that everybody uses this technology and these technologies every day is really inspiring to me. I'm glad I got into the game. But what's happened over a period of time is that the willingness of the people who back these kinds of uh, enterprises that develop technology, uh, they've become less willing to take risk. And uh, I've seen that in just about every area that we talk about, whether it's the venture capitalist, uh, uh, government grants, uh, large institutions in their research labs. And, and that's, a, that's a real tragedy because, um, you know, you really are not going to make these big innovations unless you free up the creativity of people to take risk and to fail. 
Well, you're absolutely right. At the time you and I were starting out in technology, these computers were in hermetically sealed rooms, and uh, you had to know Fortran <laughs> to be able to do anything. I remember those kids in college that were walking around with that sort of light and dark green striped paper and uh, writing computer programs. I, you know, I'm really dating myself by saying that. You know, you have used a term that I've adopted and I love so much, uh, systemic risk reduction. And and as you know, systemic problems are very stubborn things, and it's the reason that things like election reform are really difficult to tackle. Yeah. So, so in layman's terms, what do you mean when you say systemic risk reduction, and is that necessarily a bad thing? Well, you know, uh, risk in the wrong places is never good. I mean, everyone has to, in our own lives, um, you know, we take risk in certain areas, but not in others. But I, when I think about that, I, you know, to, to translate it into, into something everybody deals with, mm-hmm. uh, in, in bringing up our kids today, um, what, what we really teach them is that failure is not a good thing because they have to get into the right elementary school or even kindergarten. I'm, I'm in New York right now, and you talk to people here, you know, they're so worried about getting their kids into the right kindergarten and private school, and then from there into the right middle school and high school and college. And along the way, we teach our kids that failure is not a good thing. Um, you got to get all A's, you got to score on your SATs, you've got to, you know, pump up your resume, and if you fail, that's a bad thing. And I, I think our kids come out of, uh, out of school today and out of our, uh, our upbringing, uh, you know, kind of afraid of the idea of taking risk. And, and that's certainly part of our culture now. Uh, now, the folks on Wall Street, as I look down the river here, um, are, are, <laughs> are also kind of uh, are pulling back because they went too far. And so that wasn't very good. So I I think we as a society need to find a balance between the kind of risk that were unnecessary and imprudent and and actually were harmful and the kind that that lead to creativity, that lead to innovation, that lead to the kind of uh, of insights that that you talk about in in your book and and the things that you talk about. And we've got to find a better balance than today. And we've got to begin, I think, with how we bring our kids up, how we teach them in school and what we say about failure and, and the meaning of failure. I think so often when we talk about failure, we give people the impression they didn't try hard enough. There's this sort of backside of it. When we tell kids that they didn't get good grades, they didn't manage to get into the right school, that they somehow didn't try hard enough. And I don't like the coupling of those two things because I happen to believe that we are trying to navigate in a very high failure rate environment. I believe that the more complex things get, the more wrong options there are and the fewer right options there are. And so you really do have to raise your tolerance for failure in a high failure rate environment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've got to find solutions to problems today. And the only way we're going to do that uh, we are in a high failure rate environment. We're never going to find solutions uh, unless we fail and fail again and fail consistently, but in a productive way that leads us to the solutions that, whether it's in healthcare or economics or education, we've got to be willing to experiment. I mean, think of scientists. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today talking on this phone or using this technology if scientists didn't fail a hundred or a thousand times when they tried to perfect perfect the communication device. But we're so intolerant. I mean, let's take a highly publicized failure like Solyndra. You know, when you look at when you compare the government's investment uh, track record to a venture capitalist, the government looks pretty darn good. <laughs> That's right. And those things get caught up uh, in, in political in political arguments. And, and to, to put that up there is a failure. You know, I mean, venture capitalists should be willing and the government should be willing to invest and fail, but but smartly. Um, but, you know, you take Solyndra. I don't know everything about that particular case, but I'm sure we're not going to solve the uh, energy problems of the future if we only invest in things that we think are going to succeed. Then we're going to be way too conservative. We're never going to um, wind through those uh, those wicked problems that have high levels of complexity for which we have to find new paths. So we got to keep this from being political, too. And when someone fails, when a kid fails, you tell them they didn't try hard enough. When the government invests in something that they think is worthwhile and not you, you may tell them, well, it's a failure that was no good. There's no good answer to that. We've got to view failure and experimentation as something that's necessary. But teach our kids that it's not a you know, we can't be telling them they didn't try hard enough. We've got to be applauding them when they fail and learn from it. That's That's absolutely right. And and I think that what you do is you have more resilient children when you do that. Now, we have to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about hubs of innovation where failure is being encouraged. You're listening to the Costa Report.
This Legal Minute is brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Experienced attorneys providing professional legal services to the Central Coast for 85 years. Hello, this is attorney Stephen Wagner with your Legal Minute. Have you ever said to yourself there ought to be a law for that? Well, often there is. In this segment, I will address the issue of social media and hiring practices, and specifically the potential employer's right to snoop around in social media networks to gather information about the potential employee. From the employer's perspective, social networking sites must seem like a treasure trove or petri dish, overflowing with valuable information. The hot-button legal issue that has arisen recently relates to the employer's request, or worse yet, demand, for the candidate's password and or username. It is this conduct by the employer that has sparked outcry and controversy based on privacy rights, and this has led to legislation and the enactment of laws that now prohibit employers from making such demands or requests. Such is the case in California and several other states. It would now seem that the lid has been placed back on the Petri dish. However, it is important to note that employers still have a right to access all public information. That is, anything the potential or current employee chooses to share, publish, or make public. In other words, these laws do not protect job seekers from their own stupidity or indiscretions that they decide to gloat about by publishing their escapades on the World Wide Web. So, it seems, that discretion is still the better part of valor. This is Stephen Wagner, and that's your Legal Minute. Brought to you by Nolan Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Selected in 2013 as one of the top law firms in the United States by Martindale Hubble. Hello, come join us for the first annual Pleasure Point Street Fair, Saturday, June 22nd, from 11 a.m. till 5 p.m. Admission is free. There will be art, food vendors, a beer garden, skate contest, and great music. Portola Drive will be closed between 38th and 41st Avenue from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. This event benefits the Ocean Seed Project. Come join us for the first annual Pleasure Point Street Fair, Saturday, June 22nd. Bring the whole family for a great time. If you own property, you know how much hard work goes into keeping up with it. Kubota Compact Tractors can help you power through all kinds of spring chores. If you're thinking, I'd love to own a Kubota, but can I afford a Kubota? Think CNN Tractors in Watsonville. At CNN, Kubota quality pays for a lot less than you might think. For example, the feature-loaded L3200F starts at only $12,995 with a 31.9-horsepower Kubota diesel engine. Nothing wimpy under the hood. The L3200F also features a Category 1 three-point hitch, smooth shuttle transmission, and power steering. All standard and all with the durability and reliability that a Kubota is known for. Kubota's L3200F. Think about it. With so much power, versatility, and quality, you can't afford not to take a look. Check out Kubota at CNN Tractors in Watsonville. Give us your tough jobs. Guess who? Make room at the table, KSEO, because Saturdays at 7 p.m., beginning June 22nd, we're bringing you the debut show, Out in Santa Cruz. Join Sean Ordinario, Boston transplant husband and youth advocate, along with Steph Taylor, Santa Cruz native, mother and community leader, for all things local and national with an LGBT perspective. That's out in Santa Cruz, Saturdays at 7 p.m. Tune in and get queer. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is technology pioneer Mr. Frank Moss. And before the break, you were making the point that one of the requirements of innovation is failure. And when we live in a culture that is focused on eliminating all the risks of failure, this really does thwart our ability to progress. Um, More and more, we're discovering that companies can no longer afford or find it too risky to invest in long-term primary research. And this has a lot to do with the fact that uh, it's, you know, it's embedded with failure. I mean, that's what primary research does. There's more failures than successes. Um, And it may, in the end, not result in anything which pays off from a financial perspective. And so more and more we see these corporations subcontracting primary research to universities. and, And this has now, in turn, become a major source of revenue for academia. 
So you've worked on both sides of the aisle as both a business person, person and also the director of MIT's Media Lab. So I wanted to ask you, what are these institutions like MIT's Media Lab doing to spur innovation that maybe corporations could learn from? Well, that's that's a good question, Rebecca. First of all, do, you, do I have you back? You, can you hear me? I can. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, that's 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 a good. I thing. can, I and I'm 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 excited. Our technology is working today. <laughs> it's working. Well, that's a real good question, and uh, and you've really put your fingers on it. Uh, the best that corporations are doing is outsourcing, and of course, that's not uh, a long-term sustainable um, thing. But I, I think it's a good thing to at least start with to get back in the game. Um, basically, what universities can do um, when they do it right is to allow their students and their faculties to invent and create according to their passions, uh, rather than you know specifying particular um, problem areas that need to be solved. Sometimes the most important solutions come when you have a, uh, or, or solutions to problems come when you have an idea and you don't know how that idea is going to actually pan out. And in fact, many of our most important innovations in society. The telephone invented by Alexander Graham Bell. To, initially, he was trying to um, communicate with his deaf mother. Um, the typewriter was uh, invented to enable blind people to write. All these things were never intended to solve a particular problem, and universities are in a position, at least, to do so, to allow their, their students and their faculties to invent and create, and then allow the process of serendipity to take place. Um, you mentioned uh, in my, uh, my involvement with Princeton University, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in their chemistry department several years back, a professor was trying to identify the proteins um, that led to the coloring in butterflies' wings. Uh, and through a series of coincidences and uh, connections that he couldn't have anticipated, it ended up being uh, the fundamental molecule in the drug Olympta. Uh, that today brings in a huge amount of revenue for uh, its drug partner as well as, uh, as well as Princeton, but more importantly is, is curing a lot of people out there with, with certain types of cancer. Who could have known? But and, and one of the things that bothers me, there's a judgment being made that research for research's sake, if you don't have an exact roadmap and an exact re end result in mind, if you don't achieve that end result, and if that end result doesn't pay some financial benefit at the end of it, we don't value that. We think we, we tend to look at it as a waste of money and time. I mean, how many times do we hear about the National Science Foundation where the media jumps all over them because they've funded some study where it's not really clear what the value will be? And yet the media is the worst at this. They will just, uh, you know, hang those people out to dry. Well, we've become a, a society that, that has become worshipping the business model. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the term business model, which you and I both know, is, is useful in its, in its right context when applied to innovation is completely irrelevant. And uh, you're right. People are looking for um, financial returns. The thing is, when you begin to free up research to, to invent and create without an endpoint, that's when you probably create the innovations with the greatest end result and even the greatest economic result. And that's the irony of it all. Uh, that when you subscribe, uh, when you prescribe it from the very beginning to be something that will result in a profit, I believe it's unlikely that it will. <laughs> I agree with you because I think it's too narrow a definition. The more parameters you put around something, I think the more restrictive it becomes, and you don't really get real innovation. What you get is iteration. Well, yeah, and uh, I think of some projects at the Media Lab. You mentioned I was director there uh, until a couple of years ago. Um, uh, some of the researchers there were um, applying their passion to try and find solutions for uh, kids with autism uh, you know, on the autism spectrum uh, to enable them to communicate better with their family and friends. Uh, and they developed uh, a technology that actually allowed them, uh, uh, kids with autism, to read faces, to read the emotions on the face of their mother or father or, or sibling. And uh, that's very important because they now know, am I, you know, am I, you know what, re what reaction am I stimulating in the person I'm talking to? Very important to improve their lifestyle. Well, that has had a tremendous effect on those uh, kids with, uh, on the autism spectrum, but actually led to innovations that allow marketeers to better understand the emotions of people using their products. Yes. Uh, and that has led to considerable opportunity for, uh, for profit. A company called Affectiva, which came out of the Media Lab, I, I have no interest in that particular company other than I'm a big fan, uh, began with technology to help people who are disabled, 
but ended up impacting just about, you know, every marketing person in the world. And would, who would have known if you didn't allow them to do that in the first place? Well, and now we have these smartphones that actually are watching you and watching your eye movement. So how long will it be before they're collecting data on how I'm responding to what I'm looking at on my phone? <laughs> well, we, 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 we're now awash in, uh, in, in media, you know, and, uh, and talk about you know, the big data revolution and what's going on. And you talk about complex problems. That's uh, probably one of the most wicked problems we have right now is to figure our way through what are we going to do with all this data, who should be interpreting, who should be owning it. Um, that's that's a huge challenge for us as a society, as you know. Oh, it's going to be a legal, it's, it'll be the legal challenge of the next decade, no question. But you know, we both work in technology, and after a long enough period of time, you see a lot of inventions, many breakthroughs that could solve social problems that we have been grappling with for generations. And one after another, I've seen these solutions get starved to death for lack of funding. Uh, One day, um, Ed Wilson, who's right there at Harvard, said to me, economics is ruining everything. If it doesn't fit into an economic model, it doesn't happen, and it doesn't matter how good for humanity or the planet it is. Well, you're talking about how we measure what we do in, in, in society today. And uh, I'm afraid, we be, again, we've become a society. Uh, I use the term economics. I use the term business model. Uh, we, we're starting to teach kids business model in elementary school. And as you well know, a business model, which evaluates profit and loss and forecasts cash flow and all that kind of good stuff, is important when you're running a business. But, you know, if you apply that to um, invention and science, it's disastrous. And and therefore we have the situation that we have right now. Um, but well, there are, there are, there are some bright spots uh, in that. I mean, we're starting to, starting to see um, actually some of the uh, the great economic wealth that was created uh, in the way we talk about going back into social issues. So social entrepreneurship is uh, is a, a category that's uh, emerging right now where money's being invested where the goal is not necessarily economic. Uh, results, but, you know, um, you know, dealing with disabilities or, or disease or, or... But overwhelmingly, we can agree that the main, uh, the main impetus has been to may only invest in those things that are low risk and appear to uh, produce very, very high amounts of profit at the back end. That's, now, we're going to have to take another no break. And when we come back, we're going to find out where exactly technology is taking us. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you're anything like me, you're scratching your head and wondering what in the world is going on. We have plenty of technology and more resources and knowledge than at any other time in human history. But we just don't seem to be able to solve our problems anymore. They just get bigger and bigger. What's worse is we know what's going to happen if we continue down this path. And it isn't pretty. So that's why I'm asking you, nope. I'm pleading with you to take a moment to read The Watchman's Rattle, because when you do, you'll be able to spot the five impediments which stand in the way of solving our greatest threats. You'll also discover what you can do about them. Go to RebeccaCosta.com or your favorite bookstore and grab a copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Don't wait. If you care one iota about what's happening to the life you love, you owe it to yourself to read The Watchman's Rattle. It may have taken seven years to write, but you can order it in under a minute. Hi, I'm Karen from Norway. I'm an AFS exchange student living in Prunedale for the year. Living with an American family has opened my eyes to the world, and I have learned a lot about life in the U.S., as well as having had the chance to share my Norwegian culture with my American family. AFS is looking for host families for students like me. Learn more at AFSUSA.org or 1-800-AFS-INFO. AFS, connecting cultures, changing lives. 
For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home, not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply. Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Welcome to Automated Computer Services, America's most drawn out tech support line. One moment, please. For a full listing of our personnel, press 1. Please enter the person's full name, starting with their last, then their first, followed by their bank account number and their birth date. I'm sorry, there is nobody here by that name. For a full listing of our staff, press 1. To speak with a customer service representative, press 2. Thank you. Your current wait time is 4 hours and 37 minutes. Please enjoy the music. Tired of unfriendly computer support? Slow computer? Viruses? Spyware? No problem. Call the friendly computer experts at User-Friendly Computing. We take care of all your PC, Macintosh, and laptop needs. Mention KSCO and get a free $50 diagnostic. Visit us today at 505 River Street on the way to downtown Santa Cruz, across from Gateway Plaza. We give you a choice. Drop your computer by the shop, or we'll come to you. Call us today at 423-9653. User-friendly computing. We've never discussed this topic before, yet it is one of the most critical aspects of life. Care of our elder loved ones. How, what, when, and how to pay for it. Why is this subject so sensitive, and why does it make us so uncomfortable that we just avoid talking about it and dealing with it until we have to? My personal answer to that question is, I simply don't want to even think about it, much less talk about it. But our friend Kim Allen convinced me that we need to talk about this, and we will on the next KSCO special. You see, Kim's wonderful mom, Carmen, a frequent caller to KSCO for many years, is in the final stage of her life, and her loving and devoted son has much to share with all of us. So please listen and join in and hopefully share your personal experiences and ideas on the next KSCO special this Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, right here on Though We Can Never Pay Our Folks Back for What They Did For Us, We Have to Try Our Best, Nonetheless Radio, AM 1080 KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Mr. Frank Moss. And before the break, we were talking about the fact that innovations, which could be good for humankind, uh, seem to have to fit into a business model, or they have a rough time getting funded and coming to fruition. But there was a time when entities such as NASA and even large corporations funded primary research with the understanding that there would be many failures on the road to success. Now, you're in the thick of technology, so aside from shaping our lives in terms of how we shop and socialize and even surveillance more recently, what else is coming down the pike? Well, there are a couple of things that are really exciting me personally and, and you know, I think could make a, a, a difference that's way deeper than those things that you just talked about. Uh, you know, human- I hope so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I'm optimistic. We, we were a little bit, uh, you know, anxious about the things we talked about earlier in the segment. But I've I work with so many young people here in the Boston, in the Boston area and out in the valley. There's so much excitement about a couple of areas. One is the area of health. Your smartphone is becoming a scientific instrument literally, uh, and can change the equation in that it can empower you as a patient or as an individual to take control of your health in a way that we never before imagined. And we have so many um, people who are now, from physicians and clinicians to young entrepreneurs, and even big companies who are putting their money and their efforts behind that. Um, we, we see the day not too far off when healthcare can move out of hospitals, even out of clinics and doctors' uh, hospitals, doctor's offices into your home, uh, into your everyday how life. Would that, how would that work? Yeah. Well, let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. Um, we're we're um, conducting some pilots at the MIT Media Lab uh, on a technology that would enable people with HIV to uh, adhere to their drug regimen better. Now, how does it work? Um, basically, they're introduced in the doctor's office at the very beginning of the trial to a picture of how the, the HIV uh, virus attacks their T4 cells. It's like an animation. Mm-hmm. It's like just a, a very tangible picture that lets you see what happens when you're taking your drugs and what happens when you're not. 
You then download that picture onto the patient's smartphone, and you just let them go out and live their life, but all the time looking at what happens if they take their meds and how that, how that virus might attack their cells and what happens, you know, if they don't take their meds. And um, we've seen... Just so is this like a levels. visual ringtone? It's always there reminding me? It's not only reminding you, but it's giving you uh, an understanding or a deeper understanding of the process of your disease. Mm -hmm. And today we don't treat patients. Physicians in the medical system doesn't put much uh, hope that patients will understand about their disease and about themselves. And I think we're at a point in society now where people are understanding a lot of things that they didn't before. And if we give them the knowledge and the information to take control of their health, what we've found in a number of pilots and a number of people around the country and the world have is that people will react more positively. They will take their meds. Um, they will, um, you know, adhere more to diet and exercise, but they need to be treated with respect and given the information and given the data to take control of themselves. Things like smartphones, mm -hmm. uh, the Internet are all empowering that, and we're seeing any number of pilots in hypertension, um, diabetes, we talked about HIV, in cancer that are putting um, ordinary people on the same level as doctors. And when we do that, I think we have a hope of cutting this tremendous cost of health care that we have in this country and the world. I think you're absolutely right. Actually, not long ago, I saw a demonstration of IBM's Watson um, at, uh, I believe it was a hospital in Boston, where uh, Watson was is the big data uh, computer, just for listeners that are not familiar with this particular project of IBM's. Um, and they debuted it on, uh, I think it was an episode of Je Jeopardy. And, and that was a trickier thing than people realize, because... On Jeopardy, they give you the answer, and you have to form it into a question. And there are puns, and there's rhymes, and there's all kinds of squirrely kinds of questions on there. And Watson not only had to figure out what the probability of the correct answers were, it had to flip it around into a question and ring in before the other contestants. So it wasn't that easy of a job. But what I thought was interesting was that they took Watson and loaded Watson up with lots and lots of medical data so that now someone on an ER could give a patient's information as somebody was coming in the ER and Watson could spit out the probability of what needed to be done to save the patient's life, what the patient had, and what information Watson needed to increase uh, his diagnosis by 27%. Percent. Right, and there's no doubt that that kind of super technology is going to provide a resource to doctors and patients in the emergency room. But what I'd like to emphasize is what happens when an ordinary person like you and me can tap into the, the brains of Watson and apply that into our everyday daily life. That's what I want. I want a Watson for me. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's what we're doing in some of these clinical studies. I'm actually forming a company right now uh, that would enable you to tap into the power of Watson and the entire a kind of biomedical um, knowledge base in the world, but, but to tell you what to do about yourself uh, and how you can better take care of yourself and do that in ways that put a lot of confidence and faith that you can do it. And that's, the medical system was not developed in that way, but young people now are taking control of their lives in every way. They're, in the future, they're going to take control of their lives and their health in this way. And big uh, data solutions like Watson are only going to be a part of that. Now, what is it? What you know, we hear about doctors saying that their worst uh, patients are those that come in with a bunch of computer printouts <laughs> and, say, <laughs> and say, you know, listen, I've been on the internet and uh, this is what I think I have and this is what I think we ought to do. And the doctors just their eyes roll up in the back of their head. So, do you run into any? You know, you've been working in the medical community for a while now on these projects. Do you run into some uh, human resistance there? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> one of the things I'm finding, well, and, and it's true, you know, we walk into the doctor, we have this bunch of printouts that we, we got off of Google, and the doctor looks at us. <laughs> well, to be fair, the doctor is on his or her computer as well, um, not looking at you <laughs> or, or recognizing the information that you're bringing to the table. And so in today's medical system, uh, doctors and physicians and clinicians are not really using the data that you have about yourself, not necessarily what you got off the Internet, but data that you know about your lifestyle, um, your, your current condition, and it's bringing those two together to share data, to share data about the patient. Now, you talked about clinicians and, and how they're um, uh, 
uh, kind of a little bit concerned about what patients are doing. Mm-hmm. But I work a lot um, with clinicians at the Harvard Medical School and at the medical centers in Boston. And I see the young medical students all are carrying around uh, iPads. Uh, and that's what's going to change this culture of, you know, kind of the, the physician as the, uh, as the high priest. Um, the young medical students understand now the powers of these technologies, want to integrate more closely with their patients, and they're going to drive this revolution in a way that, quite frankly, some of the uh, more entrenched and I don't want to use the term older, but more senior physicians and clinicians are not doing. And that's why I'm optimistic, because other trends in society – uh, of empowerment are now going to uh, be transformed into the health into the health game. Well, in my view, we don't really have any choice but to move forward because uh, one of the most recent studies that uh, uh, was published claimed that a doctor would have to read, uh, I think, 160 hours of material a week in order to stay current in their field, because medical information is effectively doubling every three years or so. And and then they did a survey of doctors, and they said they had about one hour a week to read. So we're already at the limit, I think, of of being able to use the information that we've generated, don't you think? Well, it's going to get much worse. Because it's not just the information that's generated by the medical community, which is increasing at a very rapid rate. But when your smartphone becomes a scientific instrument and is continually monitoring your blood pressure or your blood glucose level or, or how many steps you took today or other biomedical parameters, each person is going to have attached to them a big data trove that every doctor is going to have to deal so with. So we're all big data generators suddenly. We're all big data generators. And a lot of the data, you know, we haven't even talked about this, but a lot of that data is unstructured. I think IBM's latest uh, comment was that 95% of the data we're producing is unstructured. So that even presents a bigger problem. Now we have to take our last break. When we come back, we're going to find out whether faster and better is really all that good for us. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, everyone knows that my favorite is your Pinot Noir, but Caraccioli's known for a lot more than that. It's really the bubbles that kind of differentiates what we're doing in the area as opposed to a lot of our peers. And the way that we looked at it was there's great Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fruit in the Santa Lucia Highlands in the greater Monterey County, and we wanted to be able to utilize those grapes and showcase them in a little bit different light. And to do that comes a little bit of a laborious process in terms of making sparkling wine and doing A little it. bit? A lot of bit, <laughs> but still definitely worth the trouble and worth the wait. Um, we're currently selling 2006 and 2007 sparkling wines in the beginning of 2013. So it kind of tells you the time invested as well as all of the different techniques that we use and Michelle implements to ensure that we're delivering a quality product. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. What does your website do for you? Does it simplify doing business and automate routine tasks? Does it connect with your target audience and bring new business? If you can't answer yes, then you need to contact Sunstar Media. Located on the Monterey Peninsula for over 17 years, Sunstar Media has developed websites for startups, brick-and-mortar stores, to corporations on the stock market. What makes Sunstar different is the customization that goes into every site, tailored to each client's unique needs and vision. Sunstar's experienced pros keep you ahead of the game with their custom-fit development process for website applications that cater to your company's specific needs. Learn more at sunstarmedia.com. Mention you heard this ad on the Rebecca Costa Show and get a free web analysis report on your current site or a free web consultation for your next project. Let's discuss how Sunstar can help you. Reach out to us at sunstarmedia.com. If electricity flows through it, 
you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Hello, Charlie Friedman here. Listen to the things your friends and neighbors are doing for themselves with the help of Santa Cruz Electronics. Xbox 360 repair. Solar energy kits. Musical Tesla coil. Video output for my home media center. Building a new server. Repairing a student radio station. More RAM and a sound card. DSL line. Network printing, scanning, and faxing for dentists. Replacing antivirus on 12 machines. Wireless network for court reporter agency. Diagnosing sound card problem. Building a 5 kilowatt amplifier. Ham radio antenna. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Voted best electronics store two years running. Call Santa Cruz Electronics today at 831-479-5444 or visit at 2808 SoCal Avenue in Santa Cruz. Do it yourself and save money with the help of Santa Cruz Electronics. And right here on KSCO AM 1080, we have Sundays at 4 with Dave Allen. Need I remind you? Sundays at 4 p.m. Music trivia, free prizes, or positive radio. I love Dave Allen on AM 1080 KSCO. Sundays at 4 with Dave Allen. Right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Okay, astronaut, you're up. You'll be meeting with Wish Kid Brandon. His wish is to see a space shuttle launch. All systems go. This year, more than 27,000 children will be diagnosed with a life-threatening medical condition. The Make-A-Wish Foundation can give them hope that will lift their spirits in these trying times. And, cowboy, you'll be meeting with Shayla at a dude ranch in San Antonio. Let's saddle up. Their wishes are waiting to come true. You can help make my wish happen. Visit wish.org today. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is innovator and technology visionary, Mr. Frank Moss. And before the break, you were making the point that as people become empowered and begin to monitor their own health data using their cell phones, we're each generating massive amounts of data. Now, I find that one of the biggest challenges is to make a distinction between data and knowledge. Um, data has to be correlated and interpreted and and then forged into knowledge. And, and even once we have the knowledge, we have to take it a step further to turn that into something actionable. And it feels to me like there is, you know, a chain there that people are not realizing. In fact, many times I'm in corporations where they just keep telling people, bring more data, data, data. But the back end where they're correlating it and then turning that into something actionable isn't worked on quite as vigorously. Do you run into that? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, today there's a, there's, you know, a lot of seduction. People are seduced with big data. Uh, and the collection of uh, of all this information is flowing in social media, uh, you know, and in, in, in these sensors that are uh, that are uh, you know everywhere around us. Uh, and we use the term data scientist. That's the hot new term. Uh, and you want to set loose these data scientists on this big trove of data, but it's all about the questions that you ask in the first place. And you know, um, really important innovations, solutions to problems are are accomplished by having people who are smart enough to ask the right questions. And today, I think we're not there yet. And, you know, if we're teaching data scientists to spend all their time looking for patterns, but they don't know what questions to ask, mm-hmm. then they're not going to get very good results. So I agree with you thoroughly, um, and I see a lot of uh, uh, people who are just using uh, the data available today to very, very low-level uh, use. Um, I think we've got to educate. And this gets back to if we just educate a generation of data scientists, they're going to be asking irrelevant questions of huge amounts of data. We've got to continue to educate our kids and our, our, our you know, our, and in our culture to, to value judgment, um, uh, understanding of the human side of the equation, of uh, history, and all those other things that enable people to ask important questions and not just have computer scientists turn loose on these big databases in NSA or Facebook. Uh, to ask questions that aren't going to really make all that big a difference beyond uh, what to advertise and, 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 and other rather uh, uh, unimportant questions in the, in the long pool of society. And do you feel that's going on in academia? Are we training people to be able to ask those kinds of questions and to make sense of the data in a way that is helpful to society? 
In only a limited way, Rebecca. Um, I, I think, you know, when something new like this comes on and this avalanche of data comes, I, I think we look for, uh, and even in academia, um, there are some pretty, um, you know, shallow questions being asked. Uh, I, I hate to say, but a lot of academics are now looking at how can big data be used to uh, help marketers uh, find new customers or understand what people are buying. I, I actually get sick when I see the number of projects that are going on in real in universities today that are asking those questions. Right. Well, they're trying to refine marketing, and we get back to that economic business model. Right. If, it, right. if it doesn't produce a profit uh, a, and a substantial profit, that's become the singular litmus test as to whether that research should be funded or whether it even has value. Exactly, exactly right. And uh, and today, uh, some of the things that produce economic value are really, really pretty mundane. They're superficial, uh, and I'm embarrassed. Well, you know, I think we just have to um, turn the attention on things that are deeper, uh, more important, and try and, you know, um, inspire people to ask the bigger questions, to take the bigger risk. And uh, the best we can do uh, among those of us who are concerned about this is just lead by example. Go out there. Um, try and, and, and ask those questions, uh, try and get the kinds of efforts that would do this funded, uh, help young people do this. I mean, you know, that's our position in the world right now. And but, you know, it's not just about the sales, you know, and, and, and marketing as well. I mean, you see these research projects of, for example, in the last presidential election where, you know, they're polling incessantly. And then the candidates are, are fine-tuning their messages every nanosecond uh, so that they can, you know, get, that, get those few extra votes that will push them over the top. And, but at the end of the day, what do you know about the candidate if they're responding to, you know, polling data that's coming in every nanosecond? You wonder, what have you learned? Who have you voted for? Well, we live in a real-time world, and we have what's effectively a social soundtrack that's running continually in the background of people who are feeding information voluntarily onto these social networks and into the Internet. Uh, and, um, you know, it's being used uh, to really, in, in some sense, more just make real-time narrow decisions rather than look for those big societal patterns that can enable us to understand how to solve these, these bigger, more complex problems. But I'm optimistic over time. Uh, I think we're going to understand both the strengths and weaknesses of this uh, avalanche of data, and smart people are going to move in and start using it in better ways. Now, why are you so optimistic? Because you are, you know, you're in the thick of this. You see the systemic problems. You see the big picture. You've worked on the business side. You've worked on the side of academia. What drives you? What makes you so optimistic and get up and, and boy, you know, I look at your resume and I think, when does this guy sleep? Well, the answer, <laughs> I don't know what I sleep, but the answer is simple. Uh, I work with young people. And uh, the funny thing is, the older I get, the younger the average age of people who I work with are. You know, uh, people who start companies today are in the average age is about 22 or 23. So every day I go into Cambridge. Uh, I meet with uh, two or three companies that I'm working with, young people, and these young people are really inclined, in spite of some of the things that we've failed to teach them or have taught them, to understand some of the deeper problems of society, to apply their energy and their knowledge to what they're doing to solve those problems. So the reason I'm optimistic is that I work uh, all the time with young people, and they're inspiring me because they care and they're trying, and they're really engaged in these things. So, so in many ways, you're acting as a bridge between possibly old venture capital risk reduction mentality and these young people who are inspired and motivated to uh, marry technology for uh, the greater good. Uh, yeah, and we, you know, and uh, I, I guess it's not so much a bridge as saying, look, you know, um, you're not going to get the resources from these other sources. Uh, just get going. <laughs> um, problem. Do, do something important. I'll help you get there. And when you do, um, we'll find the resources to make it happen. So like many other problems, you just have to ignore the constraints and bust right through it. And again, I'm optimistic that the, the energy and the commitment of young people today, their knowledge of the technology is, is, going, to, is going to prevail and, and is, is going to improve 
the situation that you and I have both spoken with some degree of, uh, of unhappiness about today. It's going to change. Well, you are certainly one of my heroes, and uh, I know that all the people listening today are nodding their heads and saying, go, Frank, go. (laughs) So Now, I can't let you go without mentioning your book, The Sorcerers and Their Apprentices, which is a terrific read. So before we run out of time, tell people who are listening today where they can go to keep tabs on Frank Moss and also to get the book. Uh, You can just go to Mm -hmm. frankmoss.com. And and if you want to keep tabs at me, my, uh, uh, my Twitter handle is Frank underscore moss okay and the book is available at amazon.com and the online retailers available at amazon.com terrific i hope people will pick it up because i had a lot of fun reading it that is all the time we have today but before we say goodbye i want to thank you for the work you're doing to steer innovation and technology in a direction that serves all of humankind thank you mr moss thank you rebecca it's been a pleasure if your station is leaving us after the first hour, I'd like to and and you would like to comment on today's program, you can email me at rebeccacosta.com or contact me on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We're pretty much everywhere on the internet these days. And by the way, if you haven't visited our new YouTube channel, take a moment to check out the new videos there and the audio blogs. And if you missed the full interview with Frank Moss, you can download the episodes as well as previous shows from our website. Um, They're also on Apple iTunes and Podbean. And one last thing, if you want to hear more nonpartisan programming on the air like you heard today, do something. Be part of the solution. Take a few moments to link the Costa Report to your friends because when you do, you're helping to change the face of broadcasting. It does no good to sit on your rears and complain about what you hear on the air, uh, what you see on TV. You just have to support better programming, that, and it's a very simple thing. Just turn your friends on to the program. My guest next week is former Republican Congresswoman Mary Bono Mack. She'll give us an insider's look at the challenges that modern Republicans face on the Hill and explain what needs to happen to forge a comprehensive energy policy instead of continuing to default to oil and gas, which we all know funds terrorism abroad. Don't miss Mary Bono Mac next week right here on the Costa Report, the one program you can count on to put principles ahead of partisan politics. We're better than that, and you know it. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we hear what listeners have on their mind. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Given what's going on in the world, it's more important than ever to save money. Hello, I'm Scott Bedell from Bedell Nelson Harbor Insurance, your allied agent in Santa Cruz. Bedell Nelson can save you money by packaging your home and auto coverage with Allied. We can even help you save on your vacation rental with Foremost Insurance Group. Give us a call at 426-3700 and ask for a free, no-obligation quote. We are Bedell Nelson Harbor Insurance, and we can save you money because Allied and Nationwide are on your side. 426-3700. 
By getting 400 organic farmers in Mexico to cooperate, Larry Jacobs and associates at the Del Cabo Cooperative were able to raise the annual incomes of those farmers from $3,000 to $20,000. Now Larry is in East Africa. Join me Michael Olson Saturday at 9 a.m. for a conversation with the Central Coast-owned Larry Jacobs live from Tanzania. We'll hear whether he is able to get farmers in Africa to work together as well. It's out of poverty and into Africa on the food chain. Saturday 9 a.m. right here on the big one, KSCO. What day was that? From San Jose to Salinas, Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSCO Santa Cruz.